Good afternoon. As I was introduced, my name is Monica Parker, and I'm the workplace director for a company called Morgan Lovell. And what that means as a, a workplace consultant is that I help organizations look at the intersection between their people and their property and understand that intersection in such a way that they can then use that understanding for better organizational performance. And yes, I was a homicide investigator for the Department of Justice. I worked with men and women on Florida's death row. And I worked for the defense teams that, um, that handled those cases. And what I learned through that process was the intimate relationship that people have with their environments and the impact that environments can have in both a positive and a negative way on individuals. So, Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future of work. And unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know that the future of work is changing. Um, one of these covers here, the future of work time, that's from 2006. That's pretty shocking if you think about it. That we've been talking about the future of work and how things are changing for quite a long time now. But um, what I'd like to talk to you is one of the primary drivers that are changing the future of work, and that's this idea of activity-based working. Has anybody heard of this expression, activity-based working or agile working? There's a lot of different expressions that people use when they talk about activity-based working, and these are just some of them. Agile working, workplace employee proposition, new ways of working, some of the dirty words that might be associated with it, hot desking. Um, the idea of flexible working, open plan. A lot of people um, complain about open plan, but really hot desking and open plan are just some of the outcomes that you might see in a design of an activity-based working space. But really what I like to do, sort of where I hang my hat and what I do with my clients, is this one down here, evidence-based design. I think it's really important whenever we embark on some kind of new initiative that we use evidence in order to support that and we don't go from a, a gut base. And I'll talk a little bit more about how I do that in particular. Now, when I describe activity-based working, sometimes people struggle to understand what that means. And they say, well, you know, what is activity-based working? Well, we live in an activity-based way. We don't tend to sleep in the kitchen and we don't tend to cook in the shower. We live in an activity-based way. And what that means is that we have in our homes certain settings that facilitate certain behaviors. And yet in the office, unless you're in a Google office, we tend to live in a pretty binary way. It's either desk or meeting room. And so when I talk to people about activity-based working and what that can mean for them, it's really just saying we're taking what we do in our day-to-day -day lives at home and translating that to the office. And if anybody's curious, this is a gentleman has a website called I'll Sleep On It So You Don't Have To. And basically, you can email him things that he can sleep on and he'll take a picture and post it. So again, the wild and wacky world of the internet, there's anything out there you want to find. <laughs> So when we look at some of the drivers that are changing the face of the workplace, these I think are the five sort of immutable forces that we're dealing with. And these are some of the drivers that whether you choose to embrace them or not, they will fundamentally change the future of work. And you can sort of get on or get out of the way. The first that I like to talk about is place. And I've made a point to say place as opposed to workplace or office or building because the way that we work now has fundamentally changed. We're not just working in four walls or we're not just working at a desk. And the way that I like to express that is that the time-space interdependency has fundamentally shifted. We just saw that with some of the great work of Google Hangouts, that we're able to talk to people in different spaces and different times through virtual tools in a way that we never were before. And so this idea of the place that we work, work being a place you go as opposed to a thing you do, is fundamentally changing. But nonetheless, we still have issues around cost. And a lot of businesses come to me and they say, Monica, you need to help me change the way people work so that I can save money. And the fact is, is that activity-based working can save you money. It can reduce your footprint within your organization. It can allow you to take less space. Now again, Google is an example where you're able to get everything. Everybody has a desk. Everybody has all these different settings. Everybody gets to access incredible food. But the reality at most of our businesses is that we have to make choices between activity-based settings, you know, having different places where we, people can work and hang out, and the desk. And so one of the things that we are seeing is people handing over their desk in exchange for a different kind of setting to work in. And this is because of economic drivers. 
The next is around transport. Hopefully everybody had an easy ride in here today. Um, but the interesting statistic, Londoners spend 26 million hours a day commuting. That's a lot of time if you think about it. 26 million hours a day. And Transport for London says that transport woes will not reduce for the next 30 years. I hope in 30 years to be on a desert island perhaps and not commuting into work, but it's not going to get better for 30 years. And if you look at the IBM pain, commuter pain index, London is on the good side of the commuter pain. You know, you go to places like Nairobi all the way to the extreme terrible commutes globally and it's just getting worse. And so it makes us kind of question, why do people have to come into a place to work? Why do they have to do that? I'm going to show you a quick video, however, if you think your trip to work is difficult, it could be a lot worse. I'm exhausted just watching that. I feel like I need a deep breath just... This is obviously the quite famous subway pushers of Japan. And I think what's quite interesting is that um, more than likely, if we were to start employing these guys, on uh, the platform at Liverpool Street Station, people will probably be like, well, if it gets us there more efficiently, all right, go ahead and shove me in. This is a classic example of the boiled frog syndrome. When did this become somebody's new normal? When did they say, absolutely, shove me in this metal tube so that I can get one place to another just so I can get to school? I mean, this is the idea that you can place a frog into cool water and slowly turn up the heat, and it won't know well enough to leap out of the water. And the challenge is that as leaders in our businesses, we have to recognize that we are all slowly simmering away. And transport issues, it's not just for a good laugh, and no question, I like to put that in for a cheap laugh because it always helps a speaker, but the fact is, is that it's really no laughing matter. It's affecting our health and it's affecting our performance. There was a study out of the University of Essex that said that the average London commuter, by the time they arrive to work, has the adrenaline and cortisol levels of a fighter pilot or a riot police officer on duty. Think about that for a minute. A fighter pilot or a riot police officer on duty, they get psychological counseling and we give them rubbish coffee. You know, where is the balance here? This isn't just about the idea that, oh, well, they get there and maybe they're a little bit stressed out. HP termed, uh, coined a term that they call the commuter zombie syndrome. And what they said is that employees, when they arrive to the office, it actually takes them 90 minutes to reach baseline performance levels. And then stealing themselves for that trip back home, 30 minutes before they leave, their performance levels drop again. So consider this. You get people that come, they're, they're stressed out of their mind, you're losing two hours just during the course of their business day, and then we have no idea how long they've been commuting. Why is it that we have this expectation that people must be present in a work environment? So the next is tech, and obviously we're in Google, and this is a high-tech environment. Everybody's talking about these amazing gadgets and tools that people can use in their work environment, and I think they're incredible. I'm going to go back and tell my office, some of the guys there, that they need to start using some of the, the Google Docs tools. But one of the challenges is that we're not getting the basics right. I consulted with one of the big four, and they were really confused and concerned about why they were losing all their best and brightest grads who were coming in. So I started investigating this, started speaking to people and doing interviews, and 
What one of the young millennials told me is he said, Monica, when I come into the office, I feel like I have to shed my skin. I feel like I have to become a different person when I come into the space because the technology I use here is so inferior to the technology I use at home. He said, my laptop is constantly being fixed and I can't be the best employee that I want to be when I work in an environment that doesn't support me in that way. So that's something to consider that while we try to want to go to all this techno bling, we want to start giving people tablets and smartphones, if we don't get the basics right, then our best and brightest will leave our businesses. So the next, people. People's what I get most excited about. Um, it's really what I like to do. I like to get under the skin of an organization through understanding the people and what drives them. And one of the things that I think people forget is that during this time of dramatic change, and especially when you come into a, I guess, inspiring environment like Google, we forget that most of the people in our work environments are actually pretty unhappy. And these are some statistics from an Accenture study. 72% um, of UK workers are not engaged in their work. This is a self-reporting survey. The actual words that the survey used was sleepwalking through my day. 72% of respondents said they were sleepwalking through their day. Now this next statistic is the one that's particularly frightening to me. 18% of those 72% said that they actively seek to undermine their coworkers' success. Can you believe that? So you've got Three quarters who are zombies and 20% of that that are saboteurs actively sabotaging their coworkers. The lost productivity of these actively disengaged employees costs the UK economy 106 billion annually. And here's the catch. One in three workers is looking for another job, probably hoping to come to Google. And one in four intend to jump ship within a year. And you're probably thinking, well, that's great. I could probably pick one in four I'd like to jump ship. I'd name them right now, and they're probably these saboteurs. But here's the rub. It's not the saboteurs that leave. They're the ones that stay around forever. You can't get rid of them even if you want to. It's the ones. It's that scarce 28% who are engaged who are looking for another opportunity. And why do they leave? The two top reasons, culture and motivation. What kind of culture are you creating in your environment and what are you doing to motivate them in that space? Are you giving them the tools that they need? Are you giving them the space that will help facilitate their maximum performance? Because at the end of the day, if you look at some of the work done um, uh, around what drives people, is that it's about having a sense of meaning, about having a sense of, of purpose within a business. So this is a study done by BT, one of the seminal studies on agile working. And as a group of HR professionals, I think that you would appreciate it. Um, we have obviously cost reduction. One of the benefits, we're able to reduce um, in general churn costs, the cost of moving people around within um, an environment, and also the cost of our real estate. I'm going to skip the improved productivity because I think sort of the science behind it's a little bit squishy. But what I want to focus on is improved HR metrics. By giving people the choice, the freedom, the autonomy, the flexibility to choose how they work and when they work, you're able to recruit and retain the top talent and it costs you less to do so. And that is, at the end of the day, what you're being bonused on. You want to know that you're being able to bring in these top minds and keep them there. Because at the end of the day, bringing them in isn't enough. You've got to keep them there. And what is the single biggest non-remuneration benefit? It's having an agile and flexible work environment. I think there was a question in one of the sessions earlier about how is Google using big data to hire their staff. And I think it's really interesting, this idea of people analytics. And obviously, we are in the, the home of big data here at Google. But one of the things that it, I'm finding is that I'm able to use some of the work that's been done around big data to help me and my work. Um, I don't have Google Geist. I'm not able to access that. But I do use a tool called Hatch. Hatch Analytics helps me get inside, um, I guess, the skin and under the skin and inside the brain of the organizations that I work with. And it helps me really start to understand um, predictive behavior within a business and also what kind of spaces will best facilitate certain outcomes for that business. Culture. Culture is this sort of ephemeral thing and yet very palpable in a business. And you really feel it. It's almost 
dare I say, a cult here at Google. The culture is so palpable, and they're able to so clearly self-select what that Googliness is. But it's very difficult in some businesses. And while culture can be a very positive thing, culture can also be quite negative. And one of the most negative cultural attributes I see that is pervasive, it is killing corporate um, society, is this culture of presenteeism. Does so everybody understand what presenteeism is? This idea that you've got to be seen to be working. Why is it that as businesses, we expect people to be at a certain block of wood from nine to five, and that means that they're working? And these cultures are really destroying our ability to have nimble organizations, to have organizations where people are bumping into each other. This was going to be a little test, but uh, Rachel stole my thunder on, uh, on the, uh, the way that um, our trust is changing. So this is the Edelman Trust Index. And I'm going to show it to you again, because I think there's some important nuggets in here. So this is the difference between 2011 and 2012. And I think what's really striking is we see the CEO plummets, biggest decline in barometer history goes from 50% to 38. And then a regular employee or a person like yourself, greatest increase since 2004. So why does this matter? Well, because you all are all leaders. And you're saying, well, great, where does this put me? If, I'm a, if I have director of in front of my title, if I have head of in front of my title, does that mean that the per people that report into me don't trust me? So what can you do as a business and as individuals to become more like a person like yourself? Well, Cheryl Sandberg obviously made headlines when she said she cried in front of her employees. And she did that so that she could be more vulnerable, more transparent to her employees. And we've talked a lot today about transparency. But I'm a believer in radical transparency in businesses. Because it's the way to communicate most effectively with your employees. But it's also a way for you as executives, as leaders, to become equalized with the people that you lead. Because through that transparency, through that vulnerability, and Brene Brown is a sociologist who talks about vulnerability a lot. And, and she also talks about the idea of corporate vulnerability, that as businesses, if we become more whole, more authentic, that staff will trust us. And we can use this understanding of the Edelman's Trust Index to help leverage our businesses. So what do we think is the most common emotion felt in the workplace? It's right here, anxiety. This is from another study, an Accenture study. And um, anxiety is so common. In fact, it's three times more common than the next emotion felt in the workplace. Anyone want to give a guess to what that is? Boredom. It's terrific. Um, a little bit sad. We've got people that are either stressed out or bored. But um, I, I love this slide because it is um, an emotional equation. It's from Chip Conley's book of the same name. And he says that physical equations, the idea of mathematical equations, are really just relationships between numbers. And what Chip said is that he wanted to try to discover if there were maybe relationships between words that could have that same amount of impact. And the reason that I put this up is because I think one of the advantages of transparency, one of the advantages of vulnerability in his business is that it helps us with the problem of anxiety. So in this equation here, we have anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. Now, recognizing that it's multiplicative, it's not just additive. So any increase in uncertainty or any increase in powerlessness will have a significant increase in anxiety. And I think that's very true. And the more that we're able to be vulnerable, the more that we're able to be transparent, we're able to reduce that degree of uncertainty. Can we hand over power tomorrow? No. But recognizing that you, as executives, as leaders, have a lot more power than the average staff person does. So you need to recognize that in order to give them some of that uncertainty, to reduce that uncertainty, you can do that through transparency. And then that will help you with the anxiety. To give you a bit of scientific backing to this, there was a study done by Yale University. And they gave participants a choice. They said, you can have a shock randomly to the next 24 hours. Or we'll give you a shock of 10 times the intensity at a time of your choosing. Every participant took the stronger shock. We are hardwired to want consistency in our life. We are hardwired to want to have power and to reduce that level of uncertainty. And yet we live in an uncertain world where people have been having their t power taken from them all the time. If you are transparent and you create an autonomous culture, then you'll have one that reduces anxiety. 
This is one of my favorite pieces of artwork. It's Giacometti's City Square. And if you have the opportunity to go to New York, you can see it in the Museum of Modern Art. I think this is a brilliant metaphor for a lot of our office spaces and how we operate. There's something very melancholy about this piece if you ever see it, because the way that the figures are, are juxtaposed, it's like that they'll never intersect in this city square. And it's like they're sort of alone together. And that's the title of a great book by Sherry Turkle that I'm a fan of. And she talks about how we've created a society where, at, where we are actually alone together so often. We come into work environments, but we really don't talk to each other. We email somebody sitting next to us. And then we go home, and many of us live alone. And in fact, by 2050, 40% of the UK population will be in single home dwellings. So these are individuals who come and live alone and then come to a work environment and also feel quite alone. So what can we do to create environments that are in some ways more googly, where people are running into each other, bumping into each other? If I could bottle, buzz, whatever that is, I would be a rich woman because it is on every brief I get from a client. They tell me I want to have a more buzzy atmosphere. What does buzz really mean? I think it's about people having the opportunity to to physically and virtually bump into each other. It's what futurist Richard Watson calls the bump factor, the idea that people can collide into one another in an environment and be able to share their experiences. So I guess if there's anything that you can do to create an environment in your workplaces, either virtual or physical, where people can collide into each other, that's where you'll get that buzz. So lest anybody think that you've got to have a googly environment, that you've got to be able to create beanbag chairs and wee rooms and incredible craft services. It's not about that. And so I'm going to give you an example, with all due respect, of the anti-Google that has created some of the top innovations globally in our history. This is Building 20. Building 20 was um, built on the MIT campus just after the outbreak of World War II. It was built to house the new emerging radar lab, obviously a lot of focus being put into radar technology at the time. This temporary building stood for 50 years, a little more than temporary. Um, the building was terrible. It leaked. It was cold in the winter. It was hot in the summer. It smelled. But what made it the place that housed all of these incredible innovations, the home to Chomsky and Linguistics, Bose Acoustics, Weather Radar, just to name a few? It was that people in the space had complete autonomy and how they positioned themselves and how they operated within the space. As an example, Zacharias, who built the atom first atomic clock, actually knocked out a floor in order to build it on a weekend. Anybody who's ever managed facilities or health and safety is probably starting to shake back and forth going, oh dear God, they strapped equipment to the sides of the building, they threw it in the courtyard, they had complete autonomy. So basically what this was was a giant box that took huge big brains and let them do whatever the heck that they wanted. And this is a great example of what Stuart Brand calls low road design. So I guess I'd throw this in for anybody that thinks, oh, but we can't afford what they do here at Google. You don't have to. It's about creating the opportunity for the people that you hire, presumably for a reason, to bump into each other and to have that freedom to create a space that empowers them to do the best that they can. I always like to and uh, my presentations was sort of a bit of a call to action. So this is one of my favorite quotes. There's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. That's what you all are doing here. You're trying to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. And I know it's perilous. And I know it's terrifying at times. But you've got to be the leaders to bring people through this phase and take them to a place where they can be autonomous, where they can be flexible, and where they can be authentic in their work. You can follow me, if you like to, on Twitter. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>